thank you, chairpersons, for all your kind words of introduction. And a big thank you to Dr. Manoj Chawla, Dr. Bansi Sabu, Dr. Bharat Sabu, and the entire team, DI. And a warm welcome to all of you who has joined us after lunch. We'll just take a second while they try to uh, an attempt and open the PPT that I have given to them. And the learnings that we will have today is mostly from real life clinical practice. And I always emphasize that no matter of how much of theory is spoken, the proof of the pie lies in eating it. So that is exactly what we are going to do. So this is a real case of a 54-year-old female who had visited me at the OPD on 7th of Feb. And it's the usual thing, you know. Uh, she's maxed out on all OHAs. But in spite of all the conversations that we have, she refused to take insulin. And this is not very uncommon in your clinical practice as well. Now, let me not let you go back with the idea that imiglimin is the answer to all patients who require insulin. So please do not get that idea at all. But let me give you the baselines. This was how it was. Fasting was 287. HbA1c was 8.1, blood pressure was 120 over 70, and look at the combinations uh, the person was getting. It's already on an SGLT2 DPP4 combination, it was maxed out on sulfonylurea, pyoglitazone, and so ba basically it was a desperate attempt because she refused insulin. So at this present consult, what was done was imiglimin 1000 mg uh, twice daily was added to the regimen, and then we decided to follow up after two months. So this is the result when she comes back exactly after two months. Look at the HbA1c. It has come down from 8.1 to 6.5. Fasting is down to 99, which seems like a miracle to me. Uh, without giving insulin, fasting coming down from more than 200 to 99 was a big surprise. Uh, and you can see most of the parameters were to target. Only thing was there was a, a microalbuminuria component, and that is probably why you see that um, in this present consultation, something called Kerendia 20mg was added. EGFR was more than 60. This was to address the microalbuminuria. So this is the actual prescription. The visibility is low. So I don't know how much you'd be able to see, but exactly. You see on the top, it was written in my, uh, in my prescription. If you can see in there, patient does not want insulin. That was clearly documented, so it was a desperate attempt. So I just wanted to emphasize that now probably we have something that we can explore. Now, positioning of this molecule should not be so late as a fifth or a sixth agent. Ideally, it should be placed after metformin or after a metformin DPP-4 combination. So second or third is when you should be. So be proactive because if you remember Dr. Kamlesh Kunti's uh, group, they ca came up with a publication saying that after diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, if you do not reach the target within the very first year of life, then you significantly increase the cardiovascular risk, um, cardiovascular mortality and morbidity. So how, what are the challenges that we come across in type 2 diabetes management when it comes to Indian individuals? A, beta cell dysfunction, and second is insulin resistance. Because the Indian phenotype carry a lot more fat around the waist, and because of the visceral adiposity, there is increased insulin resistance. So beta cell dysfunction or beta cell insults include cytokine-induced inflammation, obesity and insulin resistance, and overconsumption of saturated fat and a progressive decline in the beta cell, leading to beta cell exhaustion. So this is our mitochondria, and you can see the electron transport chains. And you can see the TCA cycle happening there, uh, forming reactive oxygen species, uh, apoptosis, and also ATP generation. Th this is the basic pathophysiology. So you have the epigenetic processes. You have the risk alleles. You have the mitochondrial DNA mutations, and also dysmetabolism, all of them resulting in mitochondrial dysfunction. So there are coupling factors like ATP, calcium metabolites. Uh, so basically what is happening is there is mitochondrial dysfunction in the pancreatic beta cells leading on to impaired insulin secretion. So 
eventually leading to a decreased beta cell mass, decrease in the insulin production, and also uh, stimulus secretion coupling, leading on to decreased insulin secretion. So the main mechanisms leading to insulin resistance would be increased reactive oxygen species, impaired glucose oxidation, impaired fatty acid oxidation, metabolic inflexibility, and also we have the um, ER mitochondrial uh, dysfunctioning as well. So insulin resistance will affect the white adipose tissue, the skeletal muscle, as well as the liver. So mitochondrial dysfunction and type 2 diabetes, you have two factors. One is the genetic factor, like mitochondrial DNA mutations. Uh, also, uh, we have the nuclear DNA mutations, common genetic variants, and the environmental insults will be obesity, uh, intrauterine malnutrition, environmental pollutants, all of them leading on to mitochondrial dysfunction. So this affects the beta cells in the pancreas and also leads on to insulin resistance, leading on to type 2 diabetes. So this is a more complex diagram. However, I want to emphasize, just look how the other molecules act as compared to imiglimin. So SGLT2 inhibitors act indirectly, as you can see, by increasing the ketones, which eventually will be affecting the GLUT1 or 4 receptors. DPP4 inhibitors or GLP-1 or incretin-based therapies for that matter also uh, act via this GLUT1 and 4, and thiazolinidions again act via the GLUT1 and 4. However, if you look at the imiglimin, you can see it acts directly on the mitochondrial respiratory chain to correct the impaired bioenergetics and reduces the reactive oxygen species and increases the ATP synthesis. And that's why it's a novel molecule and very unique in mechanism of action as compared to the other um, anti-diabetic therapies. So what is the need of the hour? A drug which has got a dual mechanism of action, which can address the insulin resistance and also increase insulin secretion. So imiglimin is supposed to be the first of the group of oral tetrahydrotriazine compounds to do exactly that. So it's an approved novel drug for type 2 diabetes with differentiated mechanism of action, approved in Japan back in 2021. And now it's also approved by DCGI since November last year, supported by numerous preclinical and clinical trials, and only oral compound with dual mechanism of action to address both the uh, insulin resistance and also increase the insulin secretion. Why is this pertinent? Because in South Asian populations with type 2 diabetes, we know that they have low beta cell um, and also adiposity, BMI, and uh, incretin levels are low. So novel subgroup of type 2 diabetes, and this is uh, from the inspired study with those young diabetic who were diagnosed less than five years back, it shows that clearly there was a decrease in the beta cell function and also reduced BMI as compared to the Western uh, counterparts, which comes from the Andes cohort. So the peculiar feature of the Asian phenotype is, of course, we have more visceral adiposity as compared to our Western counterparts. And this was well documented by uh, Dr. Chitranjan Yaknik and group. So the mechanism of imiglimin is by improving the mitochondrial function by modulating complexes one and three activities, promoting mitochondrial fatty acid oxidation, and by normalizing phospholipid composition in the mitochondria of diabetic animals. Again, a slightly more complicated diagram, but basically what we are looking at is the beta cell and the insulin release. So you can see in here, when there uh, when we see that the, there's an increase in the ATP-ADP ratio, that opens up the potassium channels, leading on to depolarization of the membrane, and there is calcium influx, and because of that, there is release of insulin from the secretory granules. Look at where imiclimin works. It works at the level of uh, the NAMPT, and also increases the NAD plus levels, and uniquely, it acts on the endoplasmic reticulum and lysosome levels, leading on to increase in the calcium levels, which means there is efflux of insulin from the granules. 
The effects of imiglimin on mitochondrial energetics and the consequent effect on the liver, pancreas, and skeletal muscles. Again, consistently we have seen that imiglimin acts on all these three places, whether it's the muscles, liver, or the pancreatic beta cells. And it provides a no novel approach to treatment of diabetes due to its in unique dual mode of action, both being insulinotropic and also insulin sensitizing properties. So look at the mechanism of action of the other agents. Of course, uh, metformin can address only insulin sensitivity. Sulfonylurea mainly acts by uh, stimulating the beta cells. Incretin-based therapy is again mainly by stimulating the beta cells. Imiglimin is the only one which addresses both the com components of increasing insulin sensitivity and also uh, beta cell stimulation. So this is the mechanism of action, uh, mitochondria. We see that um, at the level of mitochondria, this, it partially inhibits competitive complex one, reduces reactive oxygen species, restores complex three function, prevents MPTP opening, and increase in the ATP generation, thus lessens release of pro-apoptotic proteins. It also improves the beta cell function and beta cell protection, and enhances insulin action at the level of liver as well as the muscles. So what are the clinical trial experience? Do we have enough data to back the use of this particular molecule? So it has undergone a robust uh, trial called the TIMES trial. And you can see in here, it has gone through the uh, proper robust drug development process of going through phase one, phase two, and phase three. Um, studies, and now we are having post-market surveillance studies that are coming up. So, efficacy and safety of imiglimin in Japanese patients with type 2 diabetes, and it was a 24-week randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled dose-ranging phase 2 B trial. And what was seen was that there was a consistent decrease in the HbA1c from the baseline, uh, which was between 7 and 10 with 1,000 mg twice daily and 1,500 mg twice daily. So given the marginal increase in efficacy with 1,500 mg twice daily versus 1,000 mg twice daily, it was prudent that this 1,000 mg dose was chosen. So times two, again, was adding imiglimin 1,000 mg twice daily uh, in, in those, uh, a, uh, those individuals who were taking any other anti-diabetic agents. And there was a reduction in the HbA1c anywhere between 0.56 to 0.96. So existing therapy, you just add imiglimin, and there was a robust drop of up to 1% HbA1c. Also, it demonstrated a robust efficacy benefit in combination with the DPP-4 inhibitors. Times 3, again, was a 16-week double-blind placebo-controlled trial where efficacy and safety of imiglimin was tested in 215 patients. And the conclusion was the open level extension period showed a sustained HbA1c reduction of 0.64%, and there was no any safety issues at all. So imiglimin and insulin sensitivity, um, it can promote insulin signal transduction by increasing AKT uh, and protein kinase B phosphorylation. And also, uh, although the underlying mechanisms of insulin sensitizing effects of imiglimin are not clearly understood, but potentially it could be glucose transporter for expression and modulating the insulin receptor substrate phosphorylation. So if you look at the PKPD, it's an oral drug administered twice daily, very low protein binding, very low hepatic metabolism, urinary exc excretion is unchanged, no drug-to-drug -drug interactions, no QT prolongation, no PK differences between Caucasian and Jap Japanese patients, and no food effect. Half-life is 13 hours. Excretion, imiglimin is not metabolized and eliminated unchanged in urine. So what are the special population? How are you going to use this molecule? The imiglimin is not metabolized and eliminated unchanged in urine. Thus, you need to have a dose reduction with declining EGFR. So, it's prudent that anyone who has got uh, EGFR between 15 and 45, you need to dose reduce and use it 500 mg twice daily instead of 1000 mg twice daily. And we have no data in the cohort 
who has an EGFR less than 15 mg. So end-stage renal disease, stage 5, we don't have any data with hemoglobin. Hepatic patients, safe and well-tolerated. Child uh, so mild to moderate hepatic insufficiency. We, uh, you can use uh, imiglimin, but advanced or child park C, we don't have any data to use imiglimin. Pregnancy, we do not have any data and should not be given. In lactating mother, again, can consider discontinuing this drug if they're breastfeeding. The take-home messages are, Currently, there are two challenges, as we said, in treating diabetes in Indian type 2 diabetics, insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction. Beta cell dysfunction results from inadequate glucose sensing to stimulate insulin secretion, and therefore elevated glucose concentrations prevail. Insulin resistance is characterized by diminished response to insulin stimulation, resulting in failure of target tissues to adequately dispose of the blood glucose. And mitochondrial dysfunction also leads on to type 2 diabetes. And imiglimin at the moment stands the only therapy that is novel, and it addresses two issues of addressing the insulin resistance and the secretory defect. So I end by saying that the proof of the pie lies in eating it. So do use it in your clinical practice, and let me know how it works for you.